Hello, and welcome to Jupyter as an enterprise do-it-yourself analytic platform. As a brief introduction, my name is Dave Stewart. For more than 15 years now, I've worked inside the US intelligence community. We're currently within an agency. I'm the lead for DIY analytics. In this role, I help to promote a do-it-yourself analytic workforce, as well as collaborate very closely with our chief data scientists and our chief analytic officer to think about both analytics and data science on the full spectrum from individual do-it-yourself style approaches all the way up through big corporate engineering type efforts. So this presentation is about a five year long effort we've had to promote Jupyter as a do it yourself analytic platform. It also touches on some insight from previous large scale DIY technology adoptions from within our organization. So the quick agenda for today is we'll talk about why we believe it's so important to promote a do it yourself approach to analytics within an organization, how we've done that by using Jupyter, what some of the benefits have been uh, from this over the years, and lastly, what are some of the challenges that we've encountered along the way. But before I go too far, I want to give a quick sense of scale uh, for the size of our efforts. So within our organization to date, we've seen over 2,000 unique users author Jupyter Notebooks, primarily Python-based Jupyter Notebooks. And these notebooks have been used by over 12,000 unique users. And the differences between the size of these two communities of authors and users at nearly six to one ratio uh, demonstrates one of the key aspects of our use case in promoting Jupyter as a do-it-yourself analytic platform, but, but particularly in using Jupyter to promote reproducible tradecraft. And you'll hear me kind of touch on this a number of times throughout the presentation. So what are the goals here uh, for, for, for DIY? First and foremost, we want to empower our workforce. And in particular, that, that is our domain knowledge expert, our intelligence analyst, so that they can create their own analytic solutions to address the speed and scale of working in this very highly dynamic and highly diverse environment of the intelligence community. Secondly, we wanna gain efficiencies in their workflows. As many data analysts can attest to, there are often are very manually repetitive, um, tedious tasks in acquiring and accumulating the data in, order, in, in a single place in order to perform that final analysis. And more often than not, for analysts, is not an insignificant amount of their day that is spent navigating a variety of tools to kind of piece together the data they want, to, they want to do their final analysis on. So how can we gain some efficiencies and buy back some of that time in, in order to enable them to really apply their expertise and their domain knowledge uh, on top of that data? Third, we want to promote reproducible tradecraft. And what I mean by that is the ability to have one analyst who can document their complex workflow or tradecraft in a format so that others can easily reapply that on top of their own data. Fourth, we wanna increase data dexterity. So that is the ability to access, analyze, and visualize data at a, at a significantly larger scale than they previously, have done, previously could have done through manual means. And then lastly, we wanna provide a bridge to data science. And that is um, provide opportunities for our domain knowledge experts and our data scientists to better collaborate on advanced data science type problems. So what has our approach been? Well, as you may have guessed, uh, we have used Jupyter heavily in this effort. Uh, we believe it offers a number of key benefits that help us address all of these, these requirements. Um, the first of which being is just being a web-based tool, it's far more approachable for our domain knowledge experts, for our intelligence analysts, who most likely don't come with a computer science or data science background and so may not have had previous experience in a traditional command line development environment. So simply being web-based already makes it far more approachable to our target audience. Secondly, the format of the, of the notebook itself really lends itself very nicely to this use case of promoting reproducible tradecraft. The ability to document your tradecraft through markdown sections within a notebook, as well as encode the actual actions of your tradecraft within the code sections, makes it far more likely that someone can not only learn about what your tradecraft is doing, but can reapply that um, in their own use case. Third is Jupyter, as we all know, is it can become an incredibly common tool used across a wide variety of industry and academic use cases. And increasingly, we're seeing new hires come into our environment that already have these skills of using Jupyter and using Python. So why would we want to retrain them on some internally developed platform when they already have the skills necessary to do a lot of our data analytic and data science tasks using Jupyter and Python. And touching more on the Python piece, there's a wealth of solutions within the Python ecosystem for many of the common data analytic, data science, and data visualization tasks that our analysts are being asked to do. 
So where we can, we should just bear, we should leverage uh, the kind of best of breed, the community consensus solutions that are coming out of that ecosystem and apply them directly um, to our problems. But simply saying we want to use Jupyter is one thing. We also needed to work to identify solutions that can offer this platform within our organizational technical and policy architectures. So if you've heard me kind of give this uh, a similar speech in the past, I've talked about our use of these ephemeral personalized virtual machines. Uh, we're now kind of uh, moving forward towards a kind of next generation container-based platform that kind of shares a lot of similar elements to the binder. And the, and the specifics of both of these platforms are, are really unique and relevant to our use case. But the broader point is, is here is that these open source solutions like Jupyter provide incredible value, but you can overlook the need for that kind of organizational connective tissue to tie these platforms into your existing technical and policy architecture. So you, you have to invest in the engineering as we successfully have done by standing up a corporate engineering team whose job it is to provide platform to provide Jupyter as a platform uh, to the broad user base within our community. We also knew getting started that it, it wasn't just enough to provide the platform. We, we needed to provide a marketplace because users of Jupyter were going to create these analytic solutions and needed a, a place for them to share it. And so we needed a resource that allows users to share, other users to discover, reuse, and build upon uh, existing solutions within that marketplace. And we've seen from previous DIY technology adoptions that the existence of a good marketplace can really make or break the success uh, of, of having that adoption within that community. We also knew that we needed to tailor that marketplace to our needs. For, starts, for starters, we knew that GitHub wasn't the best fit for us. As I mentioned, our target audience here are these domain knowledge experts, these intelligence analysts. Again, don't come traditionally from a data science or computer science background, may not have had previous experience in a command line environment. So asking them to interact with the marketplace through command line Git interactions like GitHub or GitLab could be uh, a step too far and could put it out of the reach of a large number of our users. We also needed to prioritize other things like discoverability, analytic health, and curation, all within a low-tech environment to ensure the maximum possible reach uh, of the users of this marketplace. And so what we've done is we've developed a platform called NB Gallery or Notebook Gallery, which is our enterprise Jupyter Notebook sharing and collaboration platform. I mentioned already we have 2,000 authors uh, that are creating Jupyter Notebooks, and collectively they've created over 14,000 notebooks that are being shared in that environment. And so we knew going into this that we were going to have this large number of analytic solutions within this marketplace. So how do we enable analysts to easily find notebooks that they care about? And so we built a recommender system to enable that discoverability, to pair users to notebooks within uh, that marketplace and that platform. And that's kind of step one. Step two says, I found a notebook that's relevant to me. How do I know if it still works? It could have been written six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, and it's just no longer functional. And so for that, we've developed an automated notebook health monitoring system that provides insights to the user of whether or not we believe that notebook is still functional and can still be expected to work in the current environment. At my last JupyterCon talk in 2018, I went into a lot more detail about both of those components. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, I believe that, uh, that talk is up on YouTube and you can search for it there. And then lastly, we have this third challenge of, I've found a notebook, I know that it's healthy, but does it demonstrate best practices? And so for that, we're building out a notebook curation framework that can support uh, different styles of reviews of that notebook to help ensure uh, that, that it's demonstrating best practices. So what do you mean by different styles? Well, uh, for one, we, we may want to do a code review to just help to, to demonstrate is this notebook written in the most elegant possible fashion, the most efficient code fashion? Is it utilizing corporate resources effectively and efficiently and so on? But there's also a tradecraft angle to that. Even if the notebook is beautifully written, does the notebook demonstrate the best possible approach to answering that question? And those can be two separate questions that can be answered by two separate people. And so we built a framework within NB Gallery to provide for these multiple styles of, of peer review by multiple people also recognizing that we're not going to be able to review every single notebook because there's 14,000 notebooks that are currently in there. So I'll talk in a little bit about how we potentially decide where it's worth investing in the peer review uh, for the curation framework. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of two interesting use cases we've seen that has grown out of this marketplace over the last couple of years. The first being this idea of building blocks where we have observed that users have found a lot of value in just documenting a small snippet of code 
within a Jupyter notebook that they can share for other people to learn as part of an informal learning uh, type approach. And so these notebooks in and of themselves don't help an end user uh, deliver an analytic outcome. They're, they're not a you know, wholly, encompass, uh, wholly encompassed tradecraft, but they're simply saying, here's an example of how to use this Python library to do a, a form of analysis, or this Python library that can do visualization, or here's how to interact with a corporate API to get the data that you care about. And collectively, this informal learning approach ends up creating the snowball-like effect, where the easier it is for users to discover, to discover a reproducible, well-documented example of how to do something, the more likely it is they start stitching these together in their actual tradecraft, their actual workflow to achieve their, their mission outcomes. And I believe that these building blocks are kind of directly responsible for the increased growth that we're seeing within our community over the last couple of years. So these two graphs here are showing you the total number of unique users, authoring notebooks, as well as the number of new notebooks that are, that are submitted per year. And in the last year alone, we had more than 1,000 users and nearly 5,500 notebooks um, that, 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 were, uh, that were contributed to this marketplace. The other interesting use case I want to spend a little time talking about is this idea of notebook as de facto web apps. I mentioned already about how one of our high priority use cases is promoting reproducible tradecraft. And what uh, authors of notebooks have found in our community is that by making a notebook easy to use, uh, by using things like iPy widgets and packaging it up so it looks like a very simple uh, web app for users, you end up getting more users that can benefit from that tradecraft and reapply that tradecraft, right? So imagine you're looking at these two scenarios here. You have the nice GUI on the left. You have the notebook format on the right. It's not that crazy to expect that most analysts would prefer to use that, that cleanly packaged GUI that was created through iPy widgets. In this case here, it's the same notebook, right? So when you run that notebook code on the right, you get generated that nice GUI, <coughs> excuse me, on the left. Um, for an, another analyst to just simply go in there, enter their query parameters, and dive right in and start doing their analysis. But this use case of kind of notebooks as de facto web apps introduces some conflict and some challenges within our community, within our use case. As I already mentioned, there's no question that the increased usability is enormously beneficial to get more of our domain knowledge experts, more of our intelligence analysts using these existing tools. There's additional benefit of time to market. The author who developed the tradecraft within the notebook, kind of iterated over it, has a quick way to deploy that and, and, and show that to other users. Uh, I, I would argue far quicker than creating a dedicated web app uh, for that notebook. However, though, re-engineering a notebook to, to, to be written as one of these de facto web apps introduces some challenges that takes away from the overall readability of the code and the ability to debug. And that's because much of the workflow of the notebook is now put in callback functions that get executed on, 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 uh, on click events for the, uh, for the IPy widget code. And so this kind of takes away from our goal of having these notebooks as these, these nice linear narratives where an analyst can not only run the notebook, but actually can go in and kind of step through the components of that notebook and easily understand what that notebook is doing. Because more often than not, an analyst's first experience with a notebook is running an existing notebook. And then they start piecing together, oh, this section of code interacted with the data source that I want to use, and this section of code performed some analysis I wanted, and this section of code performed some visualization that I wanted. And so they start learning through the experience of running notebook. But these notebook as these web apps, these de facto web apps here, take away from their ability uh, to learn and apply uh, that knowledge. One of our colleagues kind of documented these challenges in, a, in much more detail on a post in Discord. And so I'll leave it here for the presentation. But if you want to go um, read more about it, it's called Thoughts and Experiences from Using Jupyter and Enterprise. Please join in on the conversation if you have additional insights or thoughts on how we can potentially um, thread the needle between these two use cases that at times feel like they're, they're, they're pulling against each other. Another challenge we have with this path to production of, note, of, of sorry, this notebook as de facto web apps is thinking about what does it mean to have a production notebook and what potentially is the path to production uh, for these notebooks. Now, one of the ways we've thought about it is this pyramid where at the bottom, we have this very flexible space of Jupyter as a DIY platform. And 2,000 authors are creating 14,000 solutions. Inevitably, there's going to be a really powerful solution that comes out of that that we want to be used at a wider possible audience within our organization. 
historically, we've said, all right, let's go to corporate engineering and see that analytic engineered in some corporate framework. More often than not, that means re re refactoring the notebook, potentially rewriting it in an entirely different language in order to fit in a corporate platform. We don't have the resources to do that for every possible good notebook that comes out of that DIY space. And so we've kind of articulated that there's been this gap in between these two environments where there are notebooks that are providing real value, where it may not uh, you know, warrant the investment to re-engineer it into a corporate analytic framework, or the time it might take to do that uh, would, would not be worth uh, uh, that investment. And so what we've argued for and, and what we're kind of building out now is this idea of this middle tier where we can take these notebooks that are these de facto web apps, we can, we can serve them via voila, and so the user just get the web-based dashboard. We can build a platform that we call Notebook as a Service, but it's very similar kind of in, in mechanics to how Binder can work so that users can simply find one of these analytics, quickly launch into that, uh, that voila uh, dashboard view, have the resources kind of spun up the way Binder uh, does to execute that analytic. And we see this as this kind of middle tier that can take these de facto web app notebooks, serve them up in kind of a semi-type production status, while still allowing for some analytics to go to corporate engineering where it is worth the investment to re-engineer that analytic, either from a computationally uh, efficiency perspective, we can, it really needs to be rewritten in a different framework, or from a workflow integration perspective where that analytic would make sense in context of this broader corporate tool. So let's work uh, to engineer that same workflow, that same tradecraft within that larger corporate tool. And so one of the questions becomes, how do we decide where, no, where these analytics go up and down uh, this pyramid? And so one of the things that we're doing for that is trying to instrument the system as much as possible to help us make data-informed decisions about where to go up and down um, on that pyramid. And so this graph here is, uh, is one example of, of that kind of instrumentation and that kind of data. On the x-axis here, if I can get my mouse, there we go. The x-axis here is showing the total unique number of users of a given notebook. And the y-axis here is showing the average number of times that that user has run the notebook. Because the more often, on average, a user runs a notebook, the more likely it is they've incorporated that tradecraft into their daily or weekly or regular workflows. And so what we want to find here is these kind of these notebooks here in red, right, that are being used by a large number of people, potentially more than 500 unique users, but are also on average being used repeatedly by those users because these are representing solutions that are being incorporated into the daily workflows of many, many analysts. So going back to that curation framework, we know we can't review all 14,000 notebooks so which ones we would we want to perform a code review or a tradecraft review on? Probably these notebooks right here. And same goes with that middle notebook as a service tier. Which notebooks would we think we would want to uh, present via Voila dashboard in this kind of binder-like service? Again, it's the ones that kind of represent the largest possible impact and the most likely that it's been incorporated into many, many analysts' workflow. All right, so all that being said, we've. We've been working on this for about five years now. What are some of the benefits that we've observed over time? Uh, well, first and foremost, you know, I mentioned our goal here of empowering our workforce. This was a quote from one of our analysts where she talked about she was worried that learning enough code that could add value would be a far bigger time commitment than she was willing to make. And what she was surprised to find is that even just a little bit of code immediately added value to, to, her, to her job, where she was able to automate parts of her workflow, or manipulate data in ways that, that helped her make quicker, better sense of it all. And this shows for us that you know, within our domain knowledge workforce, even just a little bit of code training can go a long way in empowering them to be more efficient and more effective in their job. Additionally, we wanted to gain uh, efficiencies in their workflow. This is a, a little study that was done by a small team where they looked at six notebooks and they measured the average amount of time it took an analyst to run that same workflow by hand Again, navigating this wide variety of tools, compiling the data together manually, performing that analysis, versus how long it took to run that workflow when it was encoded in a Jupyter Notebook. And then they took that average time savings, multiplied it by the number of executions for each notebook per month to come up with the total number of hours saved per month. In this case, it was 1,400 hours saved per month over a user base that was pretty small, like with a dozen or two dozen users. And this is not to say that 
Now suddenly they don't have anything to do. They can go home early each day. They have more important things to do to spend their time on these higher order analytic tasks, you know, where they're actually applying their domain knowledge. But we're buying back some of the time that is this repetitive, uh, manually intensive side of their workflow uh, by using Jupyter Notebooks. Third here, promoting reproducible tradecraft. Again, I highlighted this a number of times. I mentioned that within the Jupyter community, we have a six to one ratio of users to authors. We've seen in some of our other DIY platforms that can grow as high as 20 to one. And so this demonstrates the benefit that even a small percentage of analytic creators, say five to 10% of your domain knowledge workforce can have within your organization if you've built the right marketplace for analytic consumers to discover and reuse those analytics. And as a side, that middle tier that we're talking about, the ability to serve notebooks as, as voila dashboard in a binder-like interface, I believe will help us increase that ratio from Jupyter from six to one to 10 to one to 15 to one, maybe even up to 20 to one. We've also increased data dexterity. And one way to think about this is this quote from this analyst where she's saying, instead of thinking about her workflow largely in terms of tools, she started to think about it more in terms of questions and data. So we're empowering analysts through programmatic means within a Jupyter notebook to access, manipulate, and visualize data at a sufficiently larger scale than they were able to do through manual means. And then lastly, we provided a bridge to data science. You know, while many of our notebooks um, objectively are not performing any type of uh, data science applications like machine learning or AI algorithms, they're doing many of the most common tasks within the data science pipeline, like cleaning or moving or analyzing and presenting data. And so the value we get from having a large portion of our domain knowledge workforce working on the same platform, Jupyter, within the same language, Python, and on the similar data science pipeline as a lot of our data scientists greatly increases the chance for better collaboration between our domain knowledge experts and our data scientists. All right, so all this being said, it's not been without some of its challenges. Uh, clearly, there's some technical challenges here that I've talked about a little bit already. Uh, these new platforms require a new infrastructure. It requires, you know, a dedicated, you know, engineering effort to bring this uh, to scale to your workforce. But also DIY means new paradigms of availability, reliability, and resource sharing because suddenly now everyone is using it. So APIs or services that maybe were created only to be used to talk amongst, you know, larger corporate tools are now being accessed by individual users. And so there's some challenges there associated with that. And also security solutions have to scale. It's critically important for us, given the sensitivity of our data, I imagine it's important for a lot of organizations. So you have to make sure that users are able to access and analyze the data in a safe and compliant fashion with whatever unique policy challenges you may have. There's also some adoption challenges, right? Introducing the kind of technology that can transform a workforce to embrace automation and work with data at scale can be very disruptive. And users who struggle to understand these new technologies or can't take advantage of their benefits will feel disenfranchised. And so as much as possible, we need to lower the barrier of entry to make these solutions as approachable as possible to the broadest possible workforce, right? And so that means meeting users where they are so that they can, can get involved and directly benefit uh, from these capabilities. We found that uh, it's really important within large organizations, particularly within a large government agency, uh, to work at the grassroots level to kind of, you know, get grassroots level buy-in to these efforts. Uh, because there can exist some worker level skepticism when there's a high, you know, uh, 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 you know, an edict that comes down from upper management of you shall use new buzzword technology because it'll solve all of your problems and that immediately can turn off a fair number of people. So we really focused initially on how do we get the grassroots buy-in uh, to this effort. We also recognized that we needed to tailor our education specifically to this use case. Because uh, as this quote suggests here, learning to code is not a career shift, but it means to better think about and tackle uh, her workflow. The key point here is that we're not trying to create new computer scientists or new data scientists out of our analysts. We're simply trying to empower them to be more efficient and more effective. And so we needed to understand what do we need to, what do we need to distill down as far as Python training and Jupyter training to, to work to that outcome, to specifically say, again, we're not trying to create new data scientists, new computer scientists, but we just want our analysts to be more empowered to do their job. And so we've created a pair of courses, one called Jupyter for Analysts, one called Python for Analysts, that specifically addresses the kind of you know, subset of, of knowledge application that we think our analysts need to, to do their job. 
All right, and then lastly, I'll just quickly talk about some of the efforts that we're doing to try to help um, the larger open source community. We've released everything we've done uh, on open source uh, within GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash mbgallery, you will see the totality of our five-year-long effort to promote Jupyter within the workforce. We also partnered with the National Science Foundation to support the Jupyter Meets Earth grant, where we actually supplied the majority of funds um, to, that, uh, to that grant to help the team further advance the state of the possible for using Jupyter to support the geoscience community because what they will create in open source will benefit us and will benefit everyone else in the community. And lastly, we're taking advantage of every possible opportunity like this uh, to share our, our story, provide insight into our use case, and to hopefully engage in better best practice sharing with other enterprises. And so that being said, if this was of interest to you and you'd like to chat more, please reach out uh, to my email address there. Please, again, if you're interested in that discourse post I posted earlier, um, go on there. But I hope this was helpful, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.